On this Wednesday night, the legal challenges of laying terrorism charges in the London killings. Mounting pressure on the police. And the motive needs to be either ideological, political, or religious. And the legacy of the family that was killed. He's probably helped thousands of families. Heated debate over Quebec's secularism law, how the London attack is reigniting criticism about Bill 21. Rules soon to be relaxed. I want to see myself. Making it easier for Canadians to come back home. Plus, trunks on a trek, the elephants attracting a mammoth audience. Global National with Donna Friesen. In London, Ontario, people are still leaving flowers and standing in silence at the site where four members of one family were run down and killed by a man in his pickup truck. A deliberate act, the police say, motivated by hate. There are demands to move beyond acts of condolence and kind words to concrete political action. This is not the first time this has happened. It has happened several times and it continues to happen. So what's going to happen? How, how are things going to be different tomorrow than what they were on Sunday. Rhetoric is not enough anymore. It's not going to change anything. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Funeral plans are underway. The community is still reeling and the nine-year-old boy who lost his parents, his sister and his grandmother is still in the hospital recovering from his injuries. In our top story tonight, Jeff Semple hears how the community is coping as new details emerge about the murder suspect. 15-year-old Yumna Ufsal was a student at the London Islamic School. The principal says she and her mother spent countless hours last summer painting this mural. The budding artist wanted to turn the blank wall in her homeroom into something beautiful. They also chose a quote, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Yumna also, with the same paint, assigned her name there. It's symbolic of who she was, of who the family was, and the real big legacy of stopping hate that's in front of us. On Sunday night, while out for a walk with her family, Yumna was allegedly murdered by this pickup truck, along with her grandmother and her parents. Her father, Salman, was a physiotherapist. Very humble man, very unassuming. He worked to rehabilitate seniors in long-term care homes, including this one. And to have somebody of that caliber and that commitment to seniors, and all of a sudden that, that loss um, to our communities is, you know, staggering. The lone survivor of the attack, nine-year-old Faez, whose photo we're not showing at the request of the family, is recovering in hospital. And he's just been told that his family didn't survive. My conversations with the family, he is their focus. This family spokesperson says the boy has relatives in the area and the community has raised more than a million dollars. A number of complete strangers have also already offered to adopt him. You can never replace your parents, but uh, I hope things will, he will have the support he needs to move forward in his life. The family's accused murderer had purchased his truck just a few weeks earlier from this dealership. After the attack, police say the driver took off for several kilometers before stopping in this mall parking lot. The car, uh, the cab was parked uh, right there. The president of the local taxi company says one of his drivers was standing outside his parked car when the suspect pulled up right behind him. The front of the truck was covered in blood. The guy says, uh, with bad language, insulting him. Um, profanity, F-words and stuff, called police, I killed someone. The cab driver said the suspect, Nathaniel Veltman, was wearing an armored vest and a military helmet. When police removed the vest, the cab driver says he saw a symbol on the suspect's shirt. My colleague explained that uh, he had a swastika signs on his uh, front, on his chest and on his back as well. But he said he was laughing the entire time as he was being dragged out of the uh, car. Police would not confirm those details, but say evidence from his arrest helped to lead them to the conclusion that the family was targeted because of their Islamic faith. It was pretty clear from the, the investigation that occurred uh, immediately at the scene. So without getting into the details of, of what, it, what evidence came from all that, we were fairly comfortable at an early stage attributing this to, to being a hate-motivated crime.
Jeff Semple is with me from London. Jeff, the police investigation is ongoing. What happens next? Well, Donna, next up, the suspect will make an appearance in court here tomorrow, expected to be pretty brief to set a date for a bail hearing. In the meantime, police are now reviewing what they say is quite a lot of video footage that was recorded by surveillance cameras in the area, as well as smartphones from people who happened to be here at the site the night of the attack. And the police chief told me today that they're particularly interested now in the suspect's online footprint, his thought process leading up to this attack, and whether the revelations there might help them to add another charge of terrorism. Donna? All right, Jeff Semple in London, Ontario. Thanks. Camille Caramali is also in London tonight. Camille, you've been talking to a spokesperson for the family. I know they are very private. What are they willing to share with the public? Yeah, that's right, Donna. The family uh, spokesperson did say the family was very overwhelmed by the show of support at last night's vigil. Thousands and thousands of people showed up to show their support for the family. The extended family of the deceased, they were not there, but they were watching from afar. Now, uh, they watched and listened from home, they said, and felt a sense of hope and show of support. A family friend is also sharing more about the family today. He said the father, uh, that Salman Avzal, was the friendliest guy imaginable. His wife Life, meanwhile, was incredibly hardworking, raising children, supporting her husband's physiotherapy practice, and getting her PhD in civil engineering. Now, friends and family, they say they can't believe this tragedy happened to a family that put so much good out into the world. But when it happens to a family like that, it's that much more, you know, painful that these people who only did good to society, they only did good to others, they were the ones who, who got the consequences of this hate. Camille, you've also spoken to the imam at the mosque in London. And while he's grateful for all the support, he is calling for more concrete action. What did he tell you? Absolutely, and that's what they're asking for. We've heard a lot of rhetoric from politicians, but they're asking right now for tangible change, real change, so that uh, they can feel safe, uh, the Muslim community can feel safe out on the streets. And now the National Canadian Council of Muslims, they've started a petition, and uh, they're calling on all levels of government to come together for a national action summit on combating Islamophobia, and they're hoping that will stir up some real concrete changes. If they're making promises and if they, they say that there are going to be changes, then that is our expectation. Because this is not about politics. This is about the lives of, of innocent human beings. This is about a sense of safety and, and security. And uh, the family uh, spokesperson has also told me that there is a funeral plan for all four of those victims, but they're not sharing the when and where publicly, Donna, because they really want it to be very private and very personal. Back over to you. All right, Camille Caramali in London, thanks. Well, many people, including the Prime Minister, have called what happened a terrorist act, and that's led to lots of questions about why terrorism charges have not been laid. The answer is complex as Mercedes Stevenson explains. Terrorism is the word that comes to mind for many Canadians when they think about what happened in London on Sunday night, including the Prime Minister. This was a terrorist attack. Public or political sentiment is not the bar for laying a criminal charge though, no matter how clear cut it might seem. The Quebec mosque shootings that left six worshiping Muslims dead. The Toronto van attack targeting women that killed 10 people. Or the stabbing and vehicle rampage in Edmonton in 2017, inspired by ISIS. Violent acts that appeared to be inspired by clear beliefs, yet none led to criminal terror charges. So what does it take? Motive is key. The motive needs to be either ideological, political, or religious in whole or in part. Terror charges also require a violent act, and courts want evidence there was an intent to intimidate or terrorize. The accused watching videos or making comments online may not be enough to convince a jury of what the attacker truly believed. That can lead police and prosecutors to choosing other charges they can get a conviction on and that carry a tougher sentence than terrorism charges. For first-degree murder, 
a sentence is an automatic life sentence with no eligibility for, for parole for 25 years. So it, it has the most stringent sentence of any offense in the criminal code. I understand that there is a component of faith and terrorism connection to all this. But first degree murder carries the most severe penalty. But some national security experts say prosecutors should consider using terrorism charges to send a message. That prosecutors need to be considering um, the denunciation and the deterrence of, of uh, terrorist violence perpetrated against um, 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 minority communities. Any potential terrorism charges in this case could take days to months to be laid as police dig through the evidence. But even acts which inflict terror may not result in terror charges. Donna? All right, Mercedes, thanks. Now to the pandemic and steps towards loosening restrictions at the border. In July, Canadian citizens and permanent residents flying back into the country won't have to stay at a government-approved quarantine hotel if they are fully vaccinated. Mike LeCouture explains. I want to see my spouse, my other half, like this person. Sarah Anderson is American while her partner and stepchildren are Canadian. Already separated by the Canada-U.S. border, pandemic restrictions and a 14-day quarantine mean a five-hour drive from Minneapolis to Thunder Bay turns into a three-week ordeal. So at this point now, uh, we're kind of back to where we were last year, where I, we can't see each other because neither one of us can at this time take off the 15-day the um, requirement. Around the first week of July, fully vaccinated Canadian citizens or permanent residents returning home by air no longer have to stay in one of those government-approved hotels. They can also stop the 14-day quarantine once the PCR test they take upon arrival comes back negative. Nothing yet for the next steps in reopening the border. It is better now to be slow and cautious, to use the best science and evidence, to be careful in our approach so that we can have a sustained success. Now, once 75% of Canadians have one dose of vaccine and 20% have two, officials say more restrictions could be eased. And there is a metric for when Canada may reopen the border to tourists. The next uh, goalpost on that front that uh, we'll be assessing is around when we achieve the 75% two dose for the eligible um, population for vaccination. So that is going to be taken into account. Now Anderson is fully vaccinated and has a family exemption, but is still unsure if the changes announced apply to her. And without more details from the Canadian government, it's hard to blame her. Now, the federal government is working with the provinces and territories on a type of vaccine passport so that Canadians can provide proof of vaccination upon arrival. But that passport will only be good if you've been given vaccines approved by Health Canada. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. It's been on life support for years. Now the Keystone XL pipeline expansion project is officially dead. Calgary-based TC Energy says it's pulling the plug and will work with government agencies to ensure safe termination of an exit from the partially built pipeline. First proposed in 2008, it was supposed to transport crude from Alberta oil sands to Nebraska and on to the U.S. Gulf Coast. It has run into multiple hurdles, and when U.S. President Joe Biden was elected, he cancelled the permits. Alberta invested $1.5 billion in the project last year. A proposed settlement for some former residential school students. Coming up, news they and their families have been waiting years for. The other children and I were physically and verbally abused for speaking our native languages. The staff told me that speaking Shwetmixchim was a heathen activity. That's Deanna Jewell. She was a day student at the residential school in Kamloops, B.C. It robbed her and thousands of other Indigenous children of their language and their cultural identity. She's one of many day scholars, kids who went to residential schools but lived close by and went home at night. They've finally reached a proposed settlement in a class action lawsuit against the federal government. David Aiken explains what they'll get and what it means not just for survivors, but for their descendants. Dina Jules was the third generation of her family to be sent to the Kamloops Residential School. She started there when she was seven. I endured five years as a day scholar and one year as a resident. 
These years were the dark ages of my life. All the students, be they overnight residents or day scholars who went home each night, were treated the same, beaten and abused if they used their own language or acknowledged their own culture. They called me a pagan and dumb Indian and told me that I needed to become more white. We were children. We did not deserve the treatment that we or I received from the priests, brothers, and the sisters. Now, Dina Jules, Charlotte Gilbert, and between 12,000 and 20,000 other day scholars or their descendants will receive a one-time payment of $10,000 as compensation for the harm they suffered, the result of an out-of-court settlement in a lawsuit that dates back to 2012. I became disconnected from my family and community. I lost language, my cultural pride, and my own identity. In addition to the individual compensation, the federal government will set up a $50 million fund to be managed by Indigenous leaders for other reconciliation projects. It is my sincere hope that this will unlock a healing process for all those involved. But even though the Day Scholars class action suit is settled, government lawyers still oppose residential school survivors and Indigenous children in several other lawsuits. The NDP, along with Indigenous advocates, say the federal government should do what it did with the Day Scholars, pull back the lawyers and settle. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Still ahead, can you condemn Islamophobia yet try to pass a law that critics say stokes it? Ahead, a deeper look at Quebec's Bill C-21. The attack in London has renewed calls to tackle racism and end policies that allow it to flourish. But it has put Quebec's Bill 21 squarely in the crosshairs. The legislation prohibits many public sector workers, such as police and teachers, from wearing religious symbols or clothing while at work. It's put lots of pressure on politicians. Mike Armstrong reports. It isn't a clear question of cause and effect, but some say it's climate. Could Quebec's controversial Bill 21 legitimize discrimination to the point it pushes hatred? Oh, I, I absolutely uh, link, link the two together. Ihab Lateaf has been fighting the secularism law since it was first tabled in March of 2019. It effectively bans anyone who wears religious symbols from working for the government in a position of authority. Someone who wears a kippah, a turban or a hijab can't be a teacher, a police officer or a judge. Lateaf says it leads to feelings of us and other. It contributes uh, very strongly to the atmosphere th that creates a fertile ground for such mentalities, such, uh, such hate, such incidents. In Quebec, under Bill 21. Bill 21 was brought up at Tuesday's vigil. The head of the National Council of Canadian Muslims calls it aggressively discriminatory legislation. When things like what happened in London happen, they don't c just happen out of a vacuum. They happen in a context. Direct to indirect. Now, the linking of Bill 21 and London has become a hot topic in Quebec media, with many blaming English journalists for pushing a narrative. Do you agree with what... The Prime Minister was asked three questions Tuesday about Bill 21 and the climate it creates. The head of the Bloc Québécois says there's no way to know if the alleged attacker had ever heard of Bill 21, and he says linking them is Quebec bashing. Bill 21 has no meaning in London, Ontario. It's disgusting that uh, people would try to make this some sort of Anglo versus Franco issue. My disagreement? The Prime Minister has said he opposes the bill but, but won't also, fight it in court. He's leaving that to citizens and advocacy groups. Quebec's Premier says the bill is popular in the province and Ottawa should stay out of the debate. Some polls have pegged support for the bill at above 60%. That is likely a factor, keeping the federal Liberals from taking too strong a stance against it. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Those elephants in China that are roaming through cities are still on the move, and a drone has caught them snuggled up in a forest for a well-deserved nap, except for the little one who seems wide awake. Drones are being used to track the elephants. The herd of 15 has trekked about 500 kilometers since leaving their nature reserve last year. Their natural habitat is vanishing. Don't you wander too far? We're back in a moment. We 
have reported on attacks motivated by hate far too often. And every time we hear the refrain, never again, then it happens again. There is much that has to change and much we all have to learn. Each one of us is part of that process and it includes listening. Even if what you hear makes you uncomfortable. We leave you with voices from London, Ontario. Insha'Allah, healing can come out of this through the prayer Allah has guided us to say. Assalamu alaikum. Faith is at the heart of the reason we are here today. It was faith that was targeted and it is in faith that we draw strength. We are always Canadians. We're always together, we're always united. This minority hate that is out there is not going to overtake. Love is greater than hate, and hate can be overcome. And for those of you who still have hate in your hearts, we want more for you. We will be resilient by being normal, by being ourselves. We will heal. My sister would not have wanted us to live in fear with wearing our hijabs. She would have wanted us to be proud of our identities. She would have wanted us to unite together, to stand for what is right. I'll leave you with the words of Yumna, my student from last year. She said, I want to leave a legacy. She proceeded to paint a mural in the mosque that reads, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. It's symbolic. It's symbolic of who she was, of who the family was, and the real big legacy of stopping hate that's in front of us, the journey we're about to take, is, 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 is the real legacy that they left.